Okay, let me just start uh, with like repeating a little bit what we talked about last time. So we have a, let's see. So we have, last time we talked about, let's say, uh, uh, near the end, we want to ask that uh, what's the probability probability that like if we have like uh, two separate independent sources let's say with like xn and yn I mean pulling sequences like xn and yn from these two separate sources and each of them with like probability px marginal probability px and py and what will be the probability that like these two sources will be joined these two sequences will be jointly typical and um, of course, it depends on like, the original distribution, like, the joint distribu John distribution, like PXY. If PXY turns out it's just equal to PX and PX times PY, in other words, if like X and Y, it turns out at the beginning it's already like uh, independent, then of course like, every sequence is uh, independently drawn from like this uh, independent sources like PX and PY will be uh, jointly typical. But on the other hand, if like PXY is very much different from PX times PY or like X and Y are highly correlated, then we expect that like sequences drawn from the like X these two sources uh, in general won't be jointly typical. A and we, we can precisely write down the probability as we mentioned last time. Basically, um, we can just say that okay, uh, for a two the two sequences, the tuple uh, that are jointly typical, the probability probability for them to be jointly typical will be basically just counting all the probability of the couples like that are uh, an element of the joint typical sequences and sum up all the possible probabilities, right? And the probabilities for those under this assumption that like xn and yn will be uh, independent, will be just p uh, pxn and yn will be just equal to pxn times pyn, and, and then like uh, because uh, xn and yn themselves are drawn from kind of like these sources, and we expect them to be typical themselves, so the probability will be bounded by this guy will be less than equal to 2 to minus nhx minus epsilon and 2 to minus nhy minus epsilon and then this can pull it out then we just have like this multiply uh, by summation of all the number of elements in the joint typical, joint typical set and the size of the joint typical set is bounded by like 2 to n hxy plus epsilon so therefore we can claim that like the probability and this I guess I can erase that the probability for uh, xn and y are jointly typical will be bounded by this one right 2 to n i x y minus 3 epsilon here and similarly we can get another bound on the opposite side Basically, we're just starting from this guy, the probability is equal to this one, but then we can have her upper bound here is bigger than equal to 2 to minus n epsilon plus epsilon, uh, nhx plus epsilon instead of minus epsilon. So therefore, like we have, let's see, yeah, some somewhere here, like we, we can have like a different bound here, say upper bound here, is a, uh, actually it's a lower bound here, is bigger than equal to this guy here, right? Plus epsilon and so on. Then again, like, it'll be, I mean, it will be basically lower bounded by 2 to, two to minus n matrix plus hy minus plus 2 epsilon, multiply the size of the uh, joint typical set. And then, uh, okay. and then the joint typical set is, uh, is bounded by the 1 minus delta, like 2 to n hxy minus epsilon, right? So that's uh, what we um, what we derived earlier, and then I like, combine all these. We will have like 
the lower lower bound is a one minus delta to the minus n x uh, sorry n i x y plus v epsilon. So so all together, this probability I didn't write it down here, but the probability that uh, probability that uh, x n and y n are joint typical. will be basically expanded by like 2 to n minus n i x y minus 3 epsilon and also like 1 minus delta 2 to minus n i x y plus 3 epsilon so that that's um, that's the final result then we we can kind of quickly talk about a uh, packing bound. I like to re repeat a little bit about uh, about that uh, uh, or the packing lemma. So basically, the packing lemma is trying to ask a question that, like, let's say if I have um, uh, we have a sequence joining uh pulling from a source like x. So we have a sequence x n here, and then like. Uh, we pull like a number of sequences from y another source y n, so it's like similar to the uh, previous case here, where two different sources one one is pulling x n out, the other pulling y n out, but uh, but uh, unlike the previous case, we are going to pull out like, more than one one i y n, so we we uh, we want to see like how many y n's we can pull out, uh, such that like. This y n will still be Johnny will still not Johnny typical with x n. So it will be kind of simple math there with the result we we just showed earlier. So let's say we pull pull out, try to pull m y n here from the source y, the discrete memoryless source like p y, and. Um, so the probability that like any one of these y and the journey typical with x n will be bounded by a union bound is m times the probability that like any one of the y n is journey typical with x n. So and this probability we just showed earlier is bounded by two to n i x y minus three epsilon, right? And so therefore, like if we set m, just define m, uh as 2 to n r or like in other words divide r as a 1 over n log m and then uh, we substitute it into that we basically will have the probability is bounded by 2 to minus n i x y minus r minus 3 epsilon so as long as r is less than i x y minus 3 epsilon and note that this epsilon is arbitrary right we can make it arbitrarily small so essentially, we, as long as we make r is less than i x y, then uh, we can ensure that like um, none of the sequences y n drawn from the source p y will be jointly typical with x n. So that that was the packing lemma we talked about last time. So now let let's talk about uh, a kind of opposite of this packing lemma will be a a coupling lemma. Coffin lemma. So the coffin lemma is simply the opposite. Again, like we we have some x n here, drawing from a source like p x, and then we have some y n, drawing from a source like p y. And the question is like, uh, how many y n we need to draw, such that we will find at least one y n will be jointly typical with x n, so it's like kind of opposite. Like we want to, uh, how many, or like, say, at least how many y n need to be drawn such that. At least one y n is Johnny typical with 
with accent something like that so uh, basically the result, results can be um, surprising or not surprising depending on your your thought like your how, how you think of this so it turns out that like as long as like our we, we, we can again defend on some our basically like you can define our the same thing as above like our equal to one over n log m so as long m m is basically the number of like y we pull out from the source p y here and um let me write a little bit better here. And as long as like R is bigger than I X Y in this case, we can show that like uh we we can at least find one Y M to be jointly typical with X N. So and uh, let's just do very similar to this proof here. So let's say like let's say the number of light like, sequences we are going to pull out again is m and is like defined by this uh, m is equal to 2 to n out there then the probability that at least one of the y n to jump be typical with x n maybe I just like copy some of this it'll be easier um, when you come from this Say that again? When it comes from m equal to 2 power m r and r. No, oh, this is just a kind of like. Uh, this is just a kind of change of variable. So either you define m or define n. Uh, either you define m or define r. Yes. Doesn't matter. It's just like saying, okay, we, we say m is the number of sequences we pull out. Mm -hmm. And then I. Like, we kind of define R as just this guy here. So either you fix R or you fix M is the same thing. So either you fix M, then you got R, right? Or you fix oh. R, you got an M, right? So what's the, the, the meaning of the, this uh, M? Uh, M? M is the number of sequences you pull out. But R is, you look at that, it's like you right. kind of increase the number of se sequences as the length increase, right? Oh, yeah. So it, it, it's just basically like you think of like per each uh, per each additional uh, n there, you double the size of like you how how fast you are increasing the number of like uh, messages you are going to pull out. Kind of like you you can think of like um, either for other cases, if n is larger, then it's less likely that the uh, or that you have more space for you to pull out from the uh, let's say the packing number you can think of like when n is larger mm -hmm. then you can pack more because I um how can I argue that pack more uh, information uh, yeah you can say that like you, you can so then like, you expect that like you you will need more y n until they will one of the y m is jointly typical with x n. So what I mean is like inherently, uh, when we ask this question, like that number of like uh, sequences will be kind of depends on the uh, the length of the sequence you pick, the length n basically that you pick. So therefore, like if we pick n as I like, this say. Like, or sorry, we pick M, I, I, I say N. If you pick M as a 2 to N R, as you can see like from the proof we have earlier, then that uh, essentially like we have the, R is basically fixed, way. Right? Yeah. M is not fixed, but R is kind of fixed, way. Right? Mm -hmm. You know that R is just basically should be like less than like R X Y here. And and then uh, and then 
and then like we want to have the hour fi- what hour is fixed mm-hmm. because of that way right? or or like I, I said yeah it's a little bit hard to I don't know it's easier to explain just look at the equation here right your r is um If your hour, just look at this here. If your hour is like less than this i x y here, mm-hmm. then you have the probabilities will goes to zero. Eh? Yes, right. And this actually, of course, here we assume that n's go to infinity, like somehow n n's become very big. So, therefore, like you see, like what w- what is keeping constant as n goes to infinity is not m, but it's r here, eh? and. So I guess uh, I, you, you can consider it as a proof device or something that like we, we just need to introduce this R instead right? because uh, in reality really your as n increases and we ask the question uh, how many of m we can pack that number will kind of go exponentially with the length of n so therefore like, we should just introduce this m as I to the n r here yeah yeah because R is constant, as fixed. R is R in the sense that you, you can, as n increases, we try to answer this question, R is kind of constant. So so as n increases, if you ask like, how many number of sequences we can pack into that, it will be like 2 to the n R. And you, you, if you continue, for example, if n is 100, I ask like, what is the number of sequences we can pack? Mm-hmm. It would be like 2 to the 100 R or something like that. And we change the, uh, our question, say, like, how about N is 200? Mm-hmm. The number will, st- will be different. Right? The, un- uh, the number will be much bigger it's mm-hmm. because it's now it's 2 to the 200 R. So, um, I mean, the way I ask this question is just, uh, it's like, let you to think about the. Uh, uh, kind of like intuitively, but don't don't forget that like that numbers will depend on like how many sequences you can pack into, um, or like we can pack such that none of them will be jointly typical with x n will be depend on n, yeah, and actually go exponentially with n, so therefore like we ha- we have defined to define this out here, yeah. And then uh, h- how much that he and and there in uh, where? Say that uh, again. I, X, Y, mm-hmm. minus 3, E. Oh, uh, this epsilon? Yeah, epsilon. Look, epsilon is a like something, it depends on, okay. Because epsilon, uh, if you, if we go back to look at like, where the epsilon come from is coming from the uh, definition of the typical sequences, right? So in the sense that it's here saying that, uh, and, um, and um, in the definition of typical sequences, basically saying that, like, okay, we would define something like within this epsilon, and uh, and um, the whole point is like, very similar to like in calculus. The epsilon here is more or less like a dummy variable. I mean, you can make epsilon as small as possible as you want. It it can be like arbitrarily small, but then like to keep your argument, you need to have like n to be much b- kind of like bigger. So, but it doesn't matter. Like this is kind of theoretical stuff. So you can, okay, if for example you pick epsilon to be zero point one, then uh, for n to be like one hundred is is enough to make most of the sequences are typical. Let's say, mm-hmm. but then like if you want to put epsilon to zero point zero one, then maybe we need to make n to be larger. Maybe like it's two hundred until that like most sequences will be t- jointly typ- uh, will be typical. So. Um, and I mean, if we go back here. So, what is the requirement for joint typical then? Uh, for them to join typical, mm-hmm. basically, let me, let me just go back to record that. For first of all, for a sequence to be typical, is like kind of a uh, just define the basically that's defined by the probability. It's bounded by it's all approximately equal to two to the matrix minus matrix, mm-hmm. and this is a as you remember last time it basically came in from the law of large number, because if you compute the expectation of this probability, it will just turn out it's equal to two to the matrix minus matrix. So as long as n goes to be larger and larger, 
then therefore like, it will be just equal to this guy here so therefore if we bound this px and to within like this plus minus epsilon like if a range there then as n goes to become big we can ensure that uh, any sequences is jointly typical uh, to be typical and then for jointly typical is like you need the sequences x and y and to be typical themselves so it's therefore satisfy these two guys here mm -hmm. and then we we have the similar kind of uh statements saying that like px and y and should be bounded by this cup to the minus uh, this will be this this joint typical should be started by this one and this one so that will be counts no 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 this is three different conditions here so this will ensure that like xn is typical okay. and this ensure yn will be typical okay. and then like johnny typical require that like xn and yn are typical and also satisfy this extra condition here oh. yeah so should be truly conditioned all three yeah. conditions should be satisfied right. yeah and if we assume that like, we assume to be like this we introduce the s epsilon here in the definition uh or basically saying that like everything it can kind of satisfy this condition we say this xn and yn will be in the typical set like then xn and yn is typical then uh you from previous class that we can show that uh that will be bound, for example, for the size of typical set and so on, right? So then the, uh, let's see if we can see where is that. Oh, this is uh, probably earlier. Yeah, this is before the homework. So then, then we will have, like, for example, the bound of the typical set, the size of typical set, or the number of typical sequences will be bounded by that, right? Uh, yeah, bounded by uh, these two sides here. Bounded like this, right? The size is bounded by this guy here. It will be larger than 1 minus delta, like 2 to n matrix, minus epsilon, and less than the 2 n matrix, epsilon there. The epsilon is coming from the definition of the typicals, yeah. So, I, uh, I really so, so what is the notation of this one? Uh, this is the size of the typical set. The size. Okay. That that means that like, how many typical sequences are uh, in are typical. Mm -hmm. so uh, I mean, how many typical sequences do you have? Like, or let me put it that way. Like, what was the. Uh, how many sequences, length and sequences, satisfy the condition we described earlier? Basically, P X N is between like two to minus n h x minus epsilon. Oops. Um, two to minus n h h x plus epsilon. What is that again? What the correlation between this, we already know, the joint with this, with this. Th this is the definition yeah, of the definition. definition of like a typical s sequence. Yes. So x n is typical, and then this is like derive. You can derive the size of the typical set way. So. Um, so that is the size. Yeah, that's the size. I mean, like, okay, okay, that you should know this notation where you have a set S. S is just the size of the set, right? That's basically for some S is equal to A, B, C is a set. Then S is just equal to 3, right? That's the size of the set. So it's just saying that oh, that is a A epsilon N is a basically A epsilon N X is equal to x to the n, I mean like for all all sequences um, let's see 
Yeah, for all sequences uh, x of length xn, I may even like write, I, uh, no, I, I don't need to confuse you more, maybe just write like this. And then like xn satisfy this, right? That's the set, set the typical set, right? Or like the set of all typical sequences. So that is k is totally just It's, it's, yes, it's just notation, it's not to the power n or something. Like a, epsilon n is saying that like, it's, a, a set of like this, mm -hmm. like, it's a set of typical sequences. Yes. Yes. So uh, if we go back like where we were like earlier, so um, so uh, again, like, if we go back to the covering lemma, so we want to ask like, how how many of this y and we draw from this p y here such that at least one of them are jointly typical with x n. Again, like this question will be sim similar to the previous like, question in packing lemma, right? Uh, that the number of like y and related to draw will kind of like increase exponentially with the length n there, right? With the length of the sequence. Uh, so therefore, like, that's why like, as we discussed like, earlier, we, we need to introduce this r again. Like, we expect r is kind of fixed eventually. Or, or I shouldn't say fix it's like as n continue to increase uh the number of sequences uh will have basically the number of sequences like that satisfy the above condition will be two to n r and r kind of does not change with like uh kind of like with n. And um and then let's ask the same question here. It's like, now if we pull m of them, or like we pull like, or we pull like two to n r, so many y n sequences, what's the probability that uh, one of the two to n r y n sequences will be jointly typical with x n? So um, that will be oh, it will be kind of like okay M R uh, yeah. I guess I a one of the y and jointly typical with x n. Okay, we can ask the opposite question. What is the probability that like uh, none of them, none of y and jointly typical with x n? So of course this is just uh, equal to one minus this probability, right? So it's the same to study other cases. So let's see like what's the probability that none of them are jointly typical. Uh I don't think I have enough space like this. Uh, let me copy to to the next page. So the probability will be basically so we, we want to see like for each of this y n let's say we have y n uh, uh, let me use okay actually I use a different notation in my slides here but it doesn't matter so let's look at each of this y n right here 
and this will be bounded by or like it will be equal to like for each of these m is equal to 1 to 2 to the n out for all the For all the sequences, uh, they are not typical, eh? so it's not in A, epsilon, N, Y, X, or X, Y. So, um, and uh, that will be basically 1 minus the probability that the sequence is typical And we, we know that like for this one we have a bound for this right and this will be less than equal to 1 minus 1 minus the probability for this guy we have a a let's see a lower bound for that is like 1 minus delta 2 to minus n i x y plus v epsilon right that we just described earlier this probability will be bounded by this guy here so um, each of them is the same then therefore it's just a product to the power weights to the uh, 2 to n r right or like weights to the power m uh, and then like this one let's see that's why this one we will use another bound here. Basically, know that like we have a simple bound that like um, one minus x is less than equal to exponential minus x. So something like one minus x will be kind of a line like that, and um, exponential minus x will be something like this. Zero here, so like that. So, therefore, like we can bound this a uh, yeah, we can bound this guy like this. Uh, this can be take as x here. Oh, don't be confused with the other x we just talked about. So, or like we can say this is one minus a exponential minus a. We can take this as a here. So therefore, like this would be less than exponential minus uh, one minus delta. Uh, wait a sec. Yeah, it's less than equal exponential one minus delta minus one minus delta. 2 to the minus n i x y plus t epsilon and to the power 2 to n r and then of course this power 2 to n r can get into the exponential that they're just equal to exponential uh, minus 1 minus delta 2 to the minus n i x y minus r plus three epsilon something like that and then again like if you have we have like um, r is bigger than i x y plus three epsilon then this will be kind of a uh, negative, right? Uh -huh. 
and then this will be positive so zero. then yeah going to zero oh no no oh, no 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 uh, we, we want this r to be bigger than this guy then this actually go to expo uh will, will go to infinity because there's a minus sign here also as well yes. yes the whole thing goes to infinity then then but of course uh, this part is uh, exponential minus this infinity things this will go to zero but uh, yeah yeah you mean the whole thing go to zero yeah we will go to zero as i uh, this is bigger than equal to ixy and n goes to infinity so uh, again like because epsilon is uh, something arbitrary we can make epsilon arbitrarily small so essentially like as long as r is bigger than ixy then uh, we can ensure that this probability will goes to zero uh, as n goes to infinity mm -hmm. so it means that like none of them y n is jointly typical with x will be will goes to zero so that means that like some of them will be jointly typical with x so that that is basically again the covering lemma so to conclude the two cases basically you have something uh, like a kind of a special number ixy here and you have a r so basically r is on the one side then you have the covering lemma you, if on the other side you have the packing lemma so if you are on this side here r is bigger than equal to two to uh, in the sense that r is bigger than ixy mm -hmm. and M is essentially is a like bigger than two to n i x y. Then we can ensure that like one of the sequence y n will be jointly typical with x n. And I um, mean it's interesting like this first was pretty like kind of like sharp cut. So if you are on the other side, you have the packing lemma. So if the number of like sequences you pull out is less than like m is essentially less than two to n i x y. Then none of the sequences will be jointly typical with x n. So that that's basically the conclusion. And uh, there's some application for packing number, confirming number, and that's one uh, actually. Yeah. Could you uh, repeat that? Mm -hmm. you repeat? Uh, what is what is the conclusion? Yeah, the lemma? conclusion and um, basically we we have a special number like like i x y here. You yes. think of like, and we we have the r that we described earlier that m is equal to two to n r. That's right. Yes, and as long as like the r is bigger than i x y, or in other words, like m is bigger than two to n i x y, yes. then we have the coupling lemma that essentially any of the sequences basically any of the 2 to n i x y sequences more than or like 2 to n r sequences will be uh, uh, will be uh, Johnny typical uh, will be kind of like Johnny typical with some uh, sequence x n oh no not uh, not some sequence but to Johnny typical to x n yeah, you pull like uh, so many, uh, so many sequences from Y here, right? So you have a like, PX and PY. So maybe I start from the beginning again. I have PX and PY. PX I draw a sequence XN here, and PY I draw many sequences. And the number that I draw will be like two to n out here. And if this R is bigger than IXY, or the number of sequences I drawn is like larger than two to n IXY, then one of the sequences will be typical, jointly typical with XN. Yeah, at least one. Then at least one will be jointly typical with XN. But on the other hand, if on the opposite side, if the number is less than this, like uh, two to n IXY, or in other words, like if R is less than IXY, then none of the sequences here would be jointly typical with xn here so it's like a a, a sharp uh, kind of a, what do you call that uh, transition so either like either <laughs> either either you cannot find any of them are jointly typical with 
big sign or like at least you will find one to be strongly typical with them. Um Yes. Um and that all depends on like whether the number is like less than I X Y or larger uh or larger than I X Y. Or or R is like less than I X Y or larger than I X Y. Or the number you pull out is less than like two to N I X Y or larger than two to N I X Y. So what what's the problem with uh, there is joint typical between B? and dy there, what's the consequence after that? Uh, actually, like, uh, I, I just want to say that, like, this one is kind of used to prove the so-called channel coding theorem for the packet number. Mm -hmm. Channel coding theorem. To explain, like, how many um, information you can send through a noisy channel. And uh, and this side like can be used to prove this so-called weight distortion theorem. That is like if you are going to compress some source mm -hmm. that be below the entropy weight. So because uh, you are compressing more uh, than is supposed to be by promised by the theoretical limits, there will be some loss there, and then therefore you can define some distortion layer. So for whatever you recover the source that will be subject to some distortion. And uh, that's film to say like, okay, what, what would be the distortion to describe like for the given weight, how much distortion you expect. And to prove the film, you will need to use this covering lemma. So uh, I may not talk about weight distortion film because I, uh, I think, um, yeah, I, I, most for most of us, I, I don't think like there are many use for that. But like for completeness, at least I will talk about a channel coding theorem. That like yeah. So we can calculate how much the, the distortion if the uh, the you know that. Yes, we. Uh, but uh, this is kind of theorem. Actually, I can give you over uh, like what would be the distortion or like the weight. Actually, it's more like defined that way. The weight would be like something like that. Uh, maximize the uh, or like actually x hat uh, p x uh, a sec p x hat given x something like that and the distortion expected distortion of x and x hat will be this is a distortion measure, it's less than equal to D. So, uh, that is the theorem, but the problem is that like, uh, you can yeah you can compute that like with that theorem, but this theorem itself is like an optimization problem. So based on like the problem you have, uh, to actually compute the weight distortion curve can be like, uh, from pretty simple to very difficult, yeah. And uh, so I guess like um, so uh, so okay. The the lateral thing for me is to continue. Be like just start talking about the uh, channel coding theorem. Then you see like why we like to talk about this packing and coupling lemma. Uh, but as I said, like, I probably won't go into the weight distortion theorem because uh, I see that like, man many of us won't see any use for that uh, unless you, mm, I don't know, it depends. I, uh, maybe later on I, I find that like we don't have anything to talk about, maybe we'll, we'll talk something about that. But at least let's go into the channel coding theorem first. So um, as I just mentioned earlier, so what is trying to study is basically, uh, okay, let me just start a new page again so the channel coding theorem so basically what we like to study is that we, we have some kind of channel 
So the channel is a very kind of generic one or like general one. So what we define by a channel is simply like a uh, a conditional probability distribution of like let's say if I have a channel, I have some uh, input symbol. Let's say I have some symbol x here, and when it go through this channel, that will the output will in general kind of uh, probabilistic given the x uh, input there. So we'll have like the output, let's say y is defined by some distribution py given x. So that, that will be a general channel. So the question would be like, for this kind of general channel, like what will be the capacity? Capacity will be in the sense like how much information we can send for this channel such that like, the source original information can be recovered losslessly. So Typically, we'll go through a process of like encoding and decoding to gain through the channel. Let's say we have some kind of message that can be also deterministic, uh, uh, probabilistic. So let's say a, a distribution of messages like M here. So we'll first go for an encoder here. So trying to encode the message. So I have an encoder here. So after encoding, I will send this encoded sequence through this channel. Typically, what's going on can be like, I have a message M here, I encode into a sequence of symbols that are going through this channel, maybe X1 up to Xn, let's say, and then I pass through this sequence for this channel, eh? and then I, I get back that my, maybe Y1 up to Yn here. Now then I will try to go for a decoder and then try to extract the information back as M hat. So what we want is like we want the probability that like M not equal to M hat to go to zero. So we want to ensure that like uh, the information we sent is not going to be um, uh, it will be most of the time it will be like error free. Uh, actually, I, I shouldn't say most of the time. It should be like, asymptotically, the error should be just close to zero. And we want to see like how much information we can send. So of course, like, one thing, I uh, just look at this model here. We expect that like, okay, this is like n here would be like, uh, the, um, And here, basically, you can think of it as the number of channel used, right? How many times I use the channel? And, and like what we described in the packing lemma and covering lemma, apparently, how much you can send for this channel, we kind of like increase, eh, you can kind of expect that, like, kind of exponentially with the number of channel used, right? So you're allowed to use more times of the number, I mean, number of times of that channel. Of course, you can send more information. So therefore, like in general, you expect that M also is should be kind of, or, or like I say M, I have uh, the number of messages I can send. Yeah. That's M, M only one, or we, we have lot, not more than one for M channel. Yeah. So this one, is this only one channel? Because it's only one. No, this is only one channel, but this is a channel use, because I, you send a sequence, right, instead yes. of, like, each time you send one symbol, right? Yes. So, for example, if n is equal to 10, you, you, you send 10 symbols across this channel, right? That's right. Yes, there's only one channel here, but, like, you use how many times on this channel, right? Oh, how many times? Yeah, right? because I then if your n is equal to 10, you essentially is actually using it 10 times, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. And then uh, you expect that you can send more information that way. So therefore, like the number of messages you expect is a like, kind of like that you can send. You expect that it will be like also like exponentially increases with the number of channel uh, number of channel use. So basically, like if I say that the number of messages is, is like two to n out here, then. Um, then uh, the capacity 
will be when we talking about the capacity of the channel is like uh, what will be the maximum uh, maximum information uh, we can send per channel use so and uh, So if you look at like if I define the number of messages is to the n hour here, and assume that like the messages are uniformly distributed, uh, then the number of bits for these messages will be simply uh, two to the n hour log two to the n hour, way, which is equal to n hour bits way. So. And then like per channel use that messages. Yes. What? Say it again. There is any messages. Oh no, that is not messages. I mean that yeah, this is the number of messages. Yes. But in terms of like number of bits of information of the messages, oh, maybe just like log number of that, mm -hmm. right? If I assume those messages are uniform. Mm -hmm. So uh and then like therefore like you in this case it will be just an hour way yes. and then like uh then you think of like uh per channel use that will be basically it's just our piece way yes. so that's you see like why why you call our is like the weight mm -hmm. it's like uh uh what's uh per each channel use like how 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 much information we are going to send for the channel and uh the capacity is basically saying that what's the maximum weight we can send for the channel per channel use. So, and essentially saying that like as long as your R is less than the capacity, then you will have uh, error uh, yes, error free transmission. Yes, it can be more than one. It can be more than one. It depends on your channel. So, but but it depends on the capacity. Where our, but given the distribution, or the characteristic of your channel, that completely characterized by p y given x. And for that, like you can de derive the capacity of the channel. And then, as long as the weight is less than that capacity, mm -hmm. you can ensure like error free transmission. So you can mature the capacitive channel from the channel PY given Yes, yes. Everything is like defined by this, I mean, characterized by this PY given X. And to jump ahead, like, the capacity is simply, is actually equal to the, um, oh, actually I made a mistake earlier for the, uh, here should be minimum. Uh, maximum the mutual information between i x and y and i x and y uh, let's see let me wait it better yeah. so uh Let's look at this expression more carefully. So I X Y is the mutual information between the input and output, right? So it with only the conditional uh probability distribution here, uh, I X Y will depend on like the 
entire distribution of x y so it depends on that what you put in x here the mutual information can be different and uh, essentially the capacity here is like quite intuitive if you think of it if you look at this expression here you're basically trying to maximize the correlation like uh, yeah the mutual information between the x and y way and the parameters you can control is like the distribution of the x way the conditional distribution is given but you can control like how x is like like for example like how many uh one you're going to send for this channel and how many zero you're going to send for the channel and so on uh such that like the mutual information between i x y will be maximized and uh, and the capacity is simply the the one with this maximum mutual information and i mean it's kind of like natural also like if if a law like what kind of x you are sending through this channel here i x y is saying like how much uh information sharing between like the input and output right and that's precisely how much stuff you can pass safely through this channel for each time you use the channel of course we will prove like why this is equal to that but uh, I intuitively the expression is not so too surprising as well because I uh, just explore this part <laughs> how much you can send for the channel will be just i x y is kind of lateral right? So this this is the information share between the input and output, and then like with this part is basically saying that we 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 have a freedom to choose p x y the distribution of x even though the conditional distribution is fixed, but we can choose the prior distribution or the marginal distribution of x uh, such that this mutual information is kind of maximized. So uh. But we don't have information of y priori. Um, no, actually, we have the distribution py given x is given. We have that. This is given. And once we fix px, then pxy will be fixed, right? Mm, yes. Because uh, your pxy is just the multiple of them, right? So this is given by the problem. This you can vary. It's controlled by the user or like whatever, like the the, the one designed the system uh, to the, the decider and code and decoder. And then once this these two are fixed, this is fixed. And this is fixed is to fix all the statistics, right? But the p y given x is will be not will be valid to can be valid to. The, no, this is like. Not it's from the I d I'm not sure what uh, when you mean it can be very like it's given by the characteristic of the channel so in other words like basically the it's yeah it's just give, given by the problem itself right so you you have a particular channel like what kind of channel what kind of statistics is given by that precise channel right? i mean like it can vary if your channel is varying but if it vary then then you, you just have like either the capacity now is suddenly increase or decrease right yes. but as long as you adapt to these changes then you can still achieve the i mean uh, to utilize the channel as most as possible Yes. Um so uh oh. and of course I like this for this film here also saying that like if your weight is larger than the capacity then like there will be no error free transmission there will be like uh, always some error when you transmit something um, we, we, we less than capacity. if it's like bigger than the capacity of course this this is also populistic so you may be lucky like you send something for uh 
for a period of time and you didn't get any problem there or maybe I'll just Yes, more than capacity. Then, um, there will be, uh, there will always be. I shouldn't say there will always be because I, um, things are stochastic, right? So you may be lucky for a while that like there's no error for like several transmission, but then, in the long run, like th th there, there definitely will be like error, mm -hmm. uh, in the transmission. Therefore, need retransmit again. Yeah, but then you retransmit, then uh, you, you essentially like uh, you would have a lower weight than you what you did, right? So it's like, have, for example, like uh, let's say your weight is like the capacity is like is like one. Mm -hmm. Now I I say like okay, let let's set the weight to be two, right? Yeah. So when we have error, then we retransmit, or like we we just every time we have error, we transmit, we transmit. But then like, every time we, tr we transmit, essentially we just do it two times, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we transmit two times, then your actual weight is actually reduced by half, right? Yeah, that's right. So actually, it's actually, you go back to the weight is equal to one, that, that that's doesn't do anything. Yeah, yeah. that's right. So, um, so it is, uh, yeah, it's a kind of theoretical limit that like, uh, it's you, you just cannot get out of that. Um and uh I'm just a remark here like um in the proof and uh as you will see like afterward like we are always uh just trying to prove a discrete channel. So in the sense that like, the symbol like X and Y is kind of discrete. But uh the uh you can easily kind of like argue uh the same um same setup or the s the same theorem can extend to the continuous case. For example if your X and Y is continuous, so let's say if I have like P Y given X here and X and Y here it turns out to be continuous, what we can do is say like we can Kind of add an a, a to D converter and D to A converter to make it like discrete channel, right? So, for example, like now this one now is kind of a discrete channel, right? Essentially, like for example, like I I have like x delta n here, which is x n. This is like it's kind of a D to e A converter from discrete to continuous, and then this. A to D from like Y N become discretized to Y delta N, let's say. So for this kind of like pseudo discrete channel, the amount of information I can send would be like I X delta Y delta A. And uh, and the capacity there will be basically that way. Right? So I'm trying to maximize this uh, P X here. Or P Yeah. So but in any case like this guy like if you remember like I can write this as like uh maximize over like H Y delta minus H Y delta of X delta and um Oh, okay, this is, uh, yeah, this is all right. And then I, 
this is like a disqui discretized entropy. And you, you remember, like, if I have a, a continuous random variable, when we discretize the random variable and compute the original entropy, mm -hmm. it's just equal to the differential entropy minus, um, minus yeah. that log delta. Right? So this is just a H1 minus log delta and minus like H y given x delta plus log delta, something like that. So the conclusion is that like if you cancel this out and then like you kind of do some approximation, it will be just equal to i x y again. So therefore, like as uh, of course, as delta goes to zero or something like that. So therefore, like you, even though like you have a discrete channel in the proof, you can extend like um, I mean the same film basically. Uh, the channel capacity. Mm. Yes. What is count from? Mm. Oh, this one from here. This yeah. one from here. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. Why yeah. so it is? It is the same. Oh, all this correct. Yes. Yes. I. I guess I will eventually need to do some approximation. This is let's try. Different x delta, but I can we can argue this is a possibility equal to h y given x as well. As long as your delta is sufficiently small. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, but my point is, I like you start with a discrete channel, we prove everything in discrete, but it is it's, it's okay because like, we can apply the same thing. A same, argu same argument to a continuous channel, as long as we pad like an A to D and D to A converter, that they are. Okay, I don't, I don't know. Like this is too. Yes. So um yes, and that that's it. Oh, okay. Where were we? Yes, yes. Where we say so. Therefore, like the same argument can extend to like continuous case. Um, as long as we 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 do this like simple kind of like a to d d to a convert uh, kind of argument. Um. Now let let's yes. Any any questions? Yeah, that's right. Yes. This mean that in the uh, in the in the uh, what's mean that in the analog or the digital is the same same ex expression. Yes, it will be like same expression. There is still this. So lo regardless, we're considering discrete and continuous case. Of course, I didn't even show anything yet. I I supposed to show you, show you the discrete case. I the um the capacity is indeed is equal to this, but. Uh, I just shook my head, uh, saying that we are not going to show explicitly for continuous case, but you can essentially use the same argument for continuous case because you can just pad uh, A to D, D to A converter with arbitrarily small delta, arbitrary small discretization. So under that assumption, then like the expression for continuous random variable use or continuous channel will still be the same. When the delta is really small, that will yeah. be has a lot of impact to the. Uh, original one. That's right. Original? No, I mean, uh, no. You, if you think of like delta is really, I think you are talking about like the H X and uh H X will be very different, right? Yes. Yes, right. but it doesn't matter. As you can see, they will got cancel here mm -hmm. in the expression because you have uh, you consider I X Y mm -hmm. instead of like H X or H Y, yeah. so you have log delta essentially will get cancel anyway. So um, I'm quite I don't understand about why in here uh, there is no why in log delta here is um, just plus with log delta only because we have y a given x delta. Uh, the no, I, I okay. I, here we assume that both okay for simplicity here we assume delta. We have the same quantization step size for delta, uh, for x and for y. So of course you can put this as like delta. Oh, wait a second. Here we are quantizing y. Mm -hmm. That's right for that. 
Oh, actually, this, this doesn't matter. Like, in the sense that we, we are quantizing, uh, yeah, quantizing y and quantizing x using the same step size. So both of them are like, step size delta here. Uh, and this is actually the quantization step size for I can write y delta, uh, actually, I should write y delta y here. This is like, it comes up because of the quantization uh, for like y delta there. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're conditioning with like x or not. Uh, Let's see. Uh, this is just coming up from the approximation of the integral, right? So basically, you uh, let's let's see if we remember how we got that. So let's say I have like h. We uh, compare h y m h y delta something like that. And this is a, a quantized version of this guy here. And then we kind of argue that like it was H Y delta, yeah. We we say that H Y delta will be P Okay, or like this will be something like summation of like E Y delta log P Y delta for or maybe I put an I here for different I here. So in the sense that this is like after quantization that you have like index like this is one, two and so on. And P Y I here is like basically this is Y one, this is Y two, and so on. It's just after quantization, like this. This is like P here is the PDF for the original distribution, continuous distribution. This is this P here. This is the PDF instead of the PMF. So then the probability will be like. P Y I multiplied by this delta, right? This delta, like this step size here, right? and, and then like this, we got like this one. That's where we got like log P Y plus log delta, right? Yes, and, and if and then like of course I have minus sign here, so therefore I have minus sign here. I have summation I P Y. Oh, that's right. Uh, let me just it's very hard to write uh, is equal to summation i p y i delta log p y i plus this minus and minus log delta here times this summation i P Y I delta. Of course, this is just some over probabilities go to one way, and um, this guy here, this approximate the uh, into the integral. That's P Y log P Y D Y. So that's why we have. This is just equal to H Y, right? Yes, right. So how about we this this guy? Yeah, but you you can essentially for H Y given x, you can do the exactly same argument, or like you, you start with hy given small x here. hy start given all x, small x is just a parameterized to the distribution with x, right? It's like, this is you can essentially say hy equal to given x equal to small x here, right? Mm -hmm. And for this guy, this the precise same argument, I don't need to even repeat that. This is just equal to uh, h y small x minus log delta. Do you agree with that? Because this is doing nothing. I'm just parameterized the, parameter, uh, the, the distribution y here. Do you agree with this guy here? Um. Of course, I can go through this, but this is just kind of redundant because. If I go through that, what I'm doing is just 
if there is not the deficit only x uh, equal to x x one. Yes, yes, this is. But then I, this one is just average, right? Then h y given x is just average. Yes, that's right. P x h y given x equal to x. Okay. Right. Then you do the average. Then of course I is. This is just p x h y given x equal to small x minus log delta y. Yeah, so we, uh, again, I, this is just sum over, can pull it out. This is just sum over a distribution equal to 1. So this guy is just equal to h y given big x, oh sorry, small h y, small h y given big x, right? Actually, I need to have some delta here, but let's put some delta back here. here. Also, x, yeah. So, so it's the same thing. Essentially, the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yes. But there is no y delta. That's a what? That's no x delta here. You're saying is that you want to say it's x delta here? Mm. Uh, you can put x delta here, or you you don't put. But it doesn't change anything because I, if you take a continuous x, this will become an integral, right? Yes, that's right. You do an integral, it's still like you you get back. Uh, it's just f. Well, how do you do a, do the average? You average over a continuous random variable or average over a discrete random variable? Oh. Yeah, it doesn't change anything. Okay. Yeah. So um okay, um maybe maybe I'll just stop here for like fifteen minutes or so, like then we come back. Right. Yeah. Yes.